established journalist who have been working for some of the largest newspaper, some of the largest new paper, paper titles here in the UK, doing international reporting. She became Muslim at the time of uh, in Afghanistan. We all know the story, but she's somebody who's become a dedicated, a dedicated and committed campaigner also for Palestine. And if you could just have a nice, loud, warm round of applause for our sister Yvonne Ridley. Zakharov. Brothers, sisters, salam alaikum. I was 14 years old when I first became involved in the Palestinian cause. And um, what I did, I signed a petition for Palestine. Because there'd been lots in the news in the, um, in the months beforehand about uh, airliners being hijacked and I thought what, what is wrong with these Arabs why are they uh, why are they so angry and I started to look into the the background of Palestine because I wanted to know why why do people jump up and and, and hijack planes and then I started reading about the Palestinian situation and you know, I'm from the northeast of England, I'm a Geordie, we lead very uncomplicated lives. And I thought to myself, I, I, I can't believe that these people have had their land stolen off them, they've been kicked off the land, they've been told that they've got no rights, and they've been told to go away. And where do you go? No wonder they're angry. And no wonder they're doing crazy things like this because the world is ignoring them. And so I decided to sign a petition in support of justice for the Palestinians. And it was so plain to me as a 14 year old that this was a huge injustice. Now at that time, and I have to say I've very I haven't really moved my political position on this, but at that time um, there wasn't talk of a road map or, um, or a two-state solution. I just thought to myself, how can you sit and negotiate with a thief? Imagine it! What the thief has to do is to return the stolen goods and then sit down and negotiate. And that is how I felt as a 14 year old, that is how I feel today, but of course because I now wear a hijab, I'm called um, a fanatic and, and a radical and an extremist for holding these views. But these are views that I have held since I was a 14 year old, looking at what is a very simple situation. The Palestinians have had their land stolen from underneath their feet and it has to be returned to them. So, moving on to why I'm here today because we're talking about um, what we've done for, for Palestine and, uh, and I was asked to talk about a boat trip I went on. In fact, Sister Lauren Ruth was um, on the same project with me and we were on the first boats that set out to break the siege of Gaza. Now a lot of people think that the siege of Gaza has gone on for a few years. It's gone on for more than 40 years. Gaza is on the rim of the Mediterranean Sea. And they have not had a single boat visit them for more than 40 years. The fishermen of Gaza have international rights, they have international law behind them that would allow them to go 10-12 miles out to sea and fish in their waters. They dared go more than a mile out to sea before the Israeli gunboats, part of the fourth largest military in the world, comes charging in and shoots at them. And this is happening in the Mediterranean. Can you imagine if this happened to Greeks as they went out to fish or if somebody tried to stop the Spanish fishermen from going out to fish? A basic human right like fishing. So we set off on these two boats 
to break the siege of Gaza. And this was a, a couple of years before the Mavi Marmara's heroic attempt. And we got out about 12 miles from Gaza and we'd had a very rough crossing and night descended and they say that the darkest hour is before dawn well I can certainly confirm that and this was a, a mixed venture there were about um, 30 different nationalities people of faith and no faith on the boat and I was with um, a filmmaker Aki Narvaz who's also a Muslim and uh, and we were trying to work out the best way to pray and, and which direction do we pray and, and in the absence of a sheikh or someone with um, great Islamic knowledge we just decided to uh, pray in the direction that we felt um, would be the direction towards the Qibla of course the boat kept rocking and turning and we must have looked quite an odd sight on this boat, especially among the secularists who were looking and thinking, what are those two doing? And then after we'd finished praying, I remember somebody coming up to me and he said, um, well, is that going to stop the Israelis from attacking? And I said to him, well, I wonder how many atheists there were on board the Titanic when it started going down. Um, we'll see. But anyway, uh, night fell, and on the radar, we picked up four or five Israeli gunboats, and they were coming in and moving in, and they were around our two boats. Our communications went down, our satellite phone went down, our mobile phones went down, anything electronic was zapped, it just completely broke down and the boat was bobbing around in the dark and I'm looking into the sea and it was inky black and we were waiting and we really thought any minute now the shells are going to fly over and we're going to be blown out of the water and then I thought I don't believe this you know there's no finer cause to die for than Palestine and I thought, my God, those Israelis are going to send me to paradise. And I became remarkably calm at the, um, at the thought of this, and indeed um, so did Aki Nawaz. And we stood there awaiting our fate. I'm sure that there were lots of secret prayers then being made by those who claimed not to pray. But alhamdulillah, I don't know what, what it was. Um, we still can't explain it. But after about an hour of this um, mental warfare, the boats just left. And we headed towards the port of Gaza. And were the first boats to enter that port in 41 years. So you can imagine the great excitement and the reception that we got from the people of Gaza. It was absolutely incredible. Thousands, tens of thousands turned out to welcome us. And as they drove us through the city, they took us um, to one square and there was a huge great big banner up there and all the faces of the 42 were up on these, this banner and, um, and the pictures were very much like their pictures of, um, of martyrs so I don't think they thought we were actually going to make it as well but alhamdulillah we did make it but the whole point of, um, of that exercise wasn't to take aid into Gaza although we did uh, take some aid with us the whole point was to highlight to the international community that this is a seaport on the Mediterranean Sea and it is the only seaport on the Mediterranean Sea 
that you can't sail into. And of course we saw what happened when the Marvi Marmara and its heroic flotilla went sailing to Gaza a couple of years later and martyrs were created. Nine Turkish peace activists were killed by the Israelis. So this is something that we have to keep on highlighting to people that this siege isn't just two or three years old, it's gone on for four decades, five decades. Um, thankfully the border at Rafa is now becoming easier to access but the Israelis are still blockading the sea, the Mediterranean Sea, and they're also blockading the air. Now we do have a plan to fly into Gaza, and we're still working on the logistics of that one, and uh, so please uh, give me your prayers. Um, I know that you gave generally, generously just before to Interpal. Interpal is probably the most exhaustively scrutinized charity there is. And you know, if you really want to hurt the Zionists, hurt them by giving money to Interpal. It really pains them. And we also, you know, every time, I promise you, every time you give money to Interpal, it causes a wave of anxiety among the Zionists. But please always remember this, that there are many Jewish people who support Interpal as well, and not all Jews are Zionists, just as not all Zionists are Jews. Um, one of the people who came on the boat trip, although she never actually did make it to Gaza, was Hedy Epstein, a remarkable Jewish lady, a Holocaust survivor, 86 years old, and she waved us off um, on our um, historic journey when we did break the siege. So, you know, Palestine is for everybody, for people of faith, Jews, Christians, Muslims, for people of no faith because it represents an injustice and we cannot rest until that injustice is gone. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Salaam alaikum. Jazakallah to our sister. Repeating the theme that I've been speaking about since the beginning. That we can't be shy about the truth. We have to stand up and speak when we see injustice. And we should never be afraid to speak the truth. And is, is not, Interpal is not a political organization. Interpal is a humanitarian organization. And Interpal is there to try and meet the needs of the people who are there on the ground, who are suffering. I noticed a change in the tide, in the politics, in the media, after the campaign in 2008-2009, the one that was over Christmas and New Year. And I noticed that because we finally started to see images on our screens that we hadn't seen here in the West. Images of what was actually happening in Gaza. And as we began to see those images, slowly, 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 the tide began to change. People they can see what's actually happening. And this is why it's so important to have objective, objective, independent news reports coming out of Gaza.